So excited to be with you all. Um, as was just mentioned, my name is Emma Lulo. I have zero credibility here. I started off as a data analyst and now I am in the data infrastructure space and working with uh, great people like Martine and doing product marketing. So I'm here to kind of dive into Martine's backstory, dive into Trino um, and start to have some of those conversations that we've been talking about all day today around lake houses. So Martin, do you want to go ahead and give yourself a little bit of an introduction? Sure. Thank you, Emma. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm, well, as Emma said, I'm uh, one of the creators of uh, Trino and Presto. Uh, I'm currently a CTO at Starburst. And I've been in the industry for about 20 something years, 22, 23 years. Uh, worked at a bunch of different companies, consumer, enterprise. In 2012, I joined um, Facebook, where, where we created uh, Presto back, back then. And, and then I, I worked on that for about six and a half years, eventually left in, in, at the end of uh, 2018. And then I went on to uh, found uh, Starburst with my colleagues and uh, other people who were involved in the, in the Presto project at the time. Hey, that's awesome. So, you know, could you go back to the time when you were just joining Facebook in 2012 and you were running into maybe some pains with the data stack there? And, and what were those pains and what initially led you to create Trino? Sure. So in 2012, uh, so Facebook was, was running one of the largest data warehouses, probably the, the largest one in the world at the time. Um, it was based on, on Hadoop, MapReduce, and at the time they were running Hive as the de facto uh, analytics engine. In fact, uh, Hive was uh, written and, and open source at Facebook back in, around 2000, 2008. And one of the issues, well, everyone, everyone, if anyone remembers Hive here, does anyone remember Hive? Yeah. <laughs> so um, one of the issues with Hive was that it was, it enabled, uh, data scientists and analysts to do things that I couldn't do before on, on the Hadoop uh, stack, but it was very slow. Uh, we, we actually have uh, an interesting story internally at Facebook. There was a data scientist, like, he gave one presentation, a presentation sometime, at some point, and he said, it is a good day when I can run six Hive queries. So that, that's kind of the state of analytics at Facebook back then. Uh, so you, you think about a company that prided itself in being a data data-driven company, and you had thousands of people doing analytics, and all they could do was six queries in a single day. So that's not a very, way to, a very efficient way to spend your, your time doing your job. It was very frustrating for people. So we set out to build a, an alternative to that. We said, well, there's no reason why this should be as slow as it is. Uh, there was another system around the time. Um, it was internal to Facebook. It was written C++, it wasn't very scalable, it wasn't very performant, it wasn't actually being maintained, uh, but uh, it, was, it was designed to query the Hadoop warehouse much faster than Hive. But we, said, we took a fresh look at that and said, we said, well, this is, um, uh, this is doesn't, doesn't work, the architecture doesn't work, and, and we, we uh, rethought the, the, whole, the whole thing from scratch. So we decided to build something anew, and that's when uh, what, why we ended up building Presto at the time. And what specifically was it about Presto, now known as Trino, that made it so much faster than that original architecture? What did you do differently? Uh, well, Hive was based on, on MapReduce. I used Hadoop MapReduce, so every query got compiled into a MapReduce job. And well, I, let's just uh, kind of go back in, in time a little bit more. If you look at uh, like when MapReduce came about, so we used to have data warehouses back 30 years ago, the commercial data warehouses, uh, Teradata, those kinds of companies. And, and then in the beginning of, two, uh, of uh, the 2000s, uh, uh, Google came up with the uh, MapReduce and, and GFS paper. They talked about a different architecture for doing analytics at, uh, and data processing at scale. And uh, the, in the open source community, they replicated that using Hadoop and, and MapReduce as a framework. And then people said, well, this is great. We can, we can use this framework to run any arbitrary computation on large-scale data, large-scale clusters, thousands of machines, and so on. And, and then Facebook came up with Hive as a, uh, implementation-wise, 
they end up taking a Hive query and compiling it into a MapReduce job. The problem with MapReduce, at least implementation back then, was that it was it made a set of trade-offs that um, they, they they compensated for being able to run at large scales and and potentially having machines that could have failures, like jobs that could have failures, by making very pessimistic assumptions about the environment. And that meant at every step in the computation, the data, the, the computation was checkpointed into uh, the storage system, into HDFS. And, and when we looked at, at that problem, we said, well, we actually don't need, we don't need all that. Like there's some, some first of all, there's different boundaries of um, fault tolerance that you, you can deal with. And in general, things don't fail uh, as badly uh, or as, as, as often and as much as, those systems assume. So we end up building an architecture that um, it, it didn't have to persist and, and checkpoint everything in the middle. So it, it, it's what, what you, you, you see today, or you actually, if you looked uh, at systems back then, traditional MPP style processing, we end up replicating the same type of architectures, like it, it distributed MPP. So it's, it's, um, you end up not having to, or you end up, being able to process data more efficiently in memory, and then only when necessary, you you write back to uh, to persistent storage. That's that's very helpful. And so you know, Trino as an MPP query engine obviously solved some of those performance issues that you talked about on the early Facebook data stack. But we're we're here today. We're here today talking about Iceberg. So there's there's other pains that still existed at the storage layer with with Hive specifically. Could you talk? A little bit about those and why you're excited about Iceberg today. Yeah, so again, going back to the kind of the history of uh, data warehouses and data analytics uh, systems, we had a lot of nice things back in in, in those systems. Like, and, and there were a bunch of presentations today that, that I talked about uh, about that. We had data management, security, um, transaction uh, uh, transaction support, so you can have consistent and and correct updates and many management of your data. So when uh, the industry moved to uh, Hadoop and MapReduce, we lost all that. All, all the nice things, we, we lost them. So Hive recovered some of that by allowing people to use a, a higher level query language uh, compared to writing um, MapReduce jobs by hand using C++ or Java or, or whatever other language you, <clears throat> you, you can think of. But there's still, there were still a lot of elements missing. Um, for example, Hive didn't deal with how do you manage your data safely? How do you make changes to your tables uh, without uh, breaking uh, the quality and the correctness of the data? How do you insert data? How do you, can you even delete data? So someone mentioned today uh, in one of the talks, you can't actually you can't delete a row in, in Hive. You have to rewrite an entire table for that or an entire partition. So how do you do that? And and then with Iceberg, we basically got all those things back. And that's, that's kind of the, the power of the, of, the, of the technology. We get all the nice things, or a, a big part of the nice things that we got back, uh, back in time in the data warehouse era in, in this new world of large scale distributed uh, computation systems. And when you're choosing both a table format such as Iceberg as well as a, a query engine such as Trino, I think there's a lot of things that go into that and factor into that decision. but in your opinion, not that you're biased at all, what makes Trino plus Iceberg so special and how do they work well together? Well, it's, it's a number of things there. Um, first thing is like they're both open source projects. They are open technologies. They are accessible. Um, anyone that wants to adopt Iceberg, I mean, they, they can do so with the confidence that it's, it's, it's a standard, it's not, uh, owned by anyone. I mean, anyone can contribute to it. They can drive the um, the, the the standard forward based on their needs. Um, same thing with with Trina. It's an open source project. Anyone can get involved. There's we actually have uh, we have uh, I know, hundreds of contributors over the last few years, and a lot of uh, major companies actively involved in the project these days. So that's one thing. It's like the openness of the platform. Uh, I think it's a very compelling compelling thing. Um, and then it is really the kind of the best of both worlds. Yeah, there, there are a number of data formats, uh, table formats out there. Uh, you have Hootie, Delta Lake, uh, you have still Hive uh, around, and then Iceberg. Uh, we've seen, I mean, Iceberg is kind of the one that is moving 
uh, moving forward the fastest. Yes, a more diverse uh, community of people involved. Um, someone in one of the slides mentioned that Delta Lakes driven primarily by Databricks versus Iceberg. So uh, you, you get all those, um, I mean, the, the, the power of being involved in, a, in an open community. And feature wise, like Iceberg has, uh, like I said, like people have talked about, and I think, um, I mean, maybe Ryan will talk a bit more about this uh, in detail, but has the ability to manage your data um, in, a, in a safe manner. You can you can update your tables and you can delete delete data, update it. Uh, you can go back in time and, and see what the state of the of the table was at a given point in time. So these are all very powerful features. And then on top of that, we have if you run with Trino, you get a very tight integration between the two systems. Trino understands the uh, the, the iceberg to a, a pretty deep level, so you can take advantage of the org data organization to optimize query execution um, by filtering data when you're when, when you're scanning tables by um, understanding the schema and how the schema evolves over time, so you can you can properly apply the the, the, the semantics of the query on top of that, and then with Trino you end up having uh, the it's like full. SQL support with very advanced uh, analytics capability, capabilities. SQL is more than just aggregations, joins, and filters. There's a, a whole set of more advanced uh, functionality that Trino implements. You have table functions uh, that can process entire tables at a time with complex uh, behavior. You have uh, window, analytic window queries, which is something that, well, any data scientist is probably familiar with. Uh, pattern recognition, so you can you can actually do processing of uh, event data and make sense of uh, patterns in your data that you cannot easily do with um, with vanilla SQL uh, or what what most people understand as SQL. So you get all those all, all those features. And one one distinctive feature about Trino is that uh, it has a connector architecture that allows it to poke into other systems. You can query data from other systems at the same time, so you can read data from, from uh, Iceberg and join it with data comes from other places. Um, if, you have, if you have a highly uh, varying data, like dimensional data, you might be able to join that. Or if you're exploring and you're not yet at the point of deciding to replicate some of your tables into your data lake, you, you can still do that type of computation uh, with Trino. So it's really like a, a best of both worlds. That's awesome. And I mean, I think we heard a lot of very cool functionality that that Trino has beyond you know your typical SQL. But I, I do want to dig into what you said in the first part of your answer, which which is the community and how fast Trino is changing. And you have we have so many contributors committing to Trino every month. And I'm not going to ask you to name who the large companies are. I'm sure we can all Google it. But could you talk about some of those exciting features that might be coming on the roadmap for for Trino? Um, so we actually had a, a summit uh, a few weeks ago, and a Trino summit, and after that we had a, a, a meeting with a number of contributors. And one of the biggest topics of, uh, of discussion was iceberg-related uh, topics. And there were, there were uh, three or two topics that, that people brought up that they're working on. One is the ability to do more advanced uh, computation, take advantage of... Um, uh, some of the st statistics that iceberg tables contain inside to be able to serve and and return results for queries much faster, like uh, by being able to take advantage of aggregated uh, um, stats, and like you you can take an aggregation query and then and speed it up by orders of magnitude potentially. Um, there was someone talking about uh, adding support for secondary indexes to speed up a certain class of queries and. This is something that uh, there's, a, there's some company that has an implementation of that. So I think they're talking about potentially even contributing that or working with the Iceberg community to make that part of the Iceberg, Iceberg standard. And then, of course, uh, adding support uh, natively in Trino for that. There were also some discussions late last year. And Ryan, we should probably pick that up at some point. Um, on So Iceberg has this concept of you can branch your your tables you can create branches of your tables you can tag them you can and that allows you to experiment on, on your data without uh safely without modifying the, the the main 
copy of your data and also without having to copy all your data into a different table. Um, so we're talking about how to add first class support for that in, in, the, in the language. You can already do some things around querying a specific branch or tag, but there are, there's no easy way to manipulate the, the branches and tags uh, from, from the SQL language. So we're talking about uh, extending the, uh, the language to support that. Those are a lot of cool features. Do you have a favorite one of the ones that you're either looking to, to contribute back to Trino or ones that we've already committed today? No, I, I think the, uh, I, I guess the iceberg brings back all the nice things that exist in data warehouses. I think one of the things that wasn't very popular or very common is the ability to uh, uh, do what, what people understand as time travel. It's like, look at your tables, uh, or the state of your database at a point in time. Uh, at any point in time in the past, and and then the ability to do branching and and, and tagging off of that. So uh, I think that that's that's a it's a very powerful feature, and I mean I hope we we can get that that in at some point. I, I think it will it will uh, make it a lot easier for people to interact and 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 manage their data in in their data warehouse uh, safely and and comfortably. Great. And I have a, a curveball question for you. <laughs> so I think, you know, with your experience building Trino, thinking about big data architectures, do you have any tips for this audience as they're looking to adopt a new lake house architecture of, you know, how to, to think about that process, how you approach when you're, you're building a new feature? Um, yeah. Kind of, could you walk us through your approach there? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry we didn't plan this one. <laughs> um, I, I, I think so. People talk about oh, should you should you switch everything to the uh, data lake house? Um, like should you throw away everything you have and and switch? Like uh, I think it's a very it's, it's a complex uh, complex answer. It's like the answer is obviously it depends uh, a lot. Um, the so uh, people are talking today like the landscape is very complicated these days uh you have like the, the whole database became unbundled over the last uh 15 years or so there's choices for everything uh and anything you can think of it's actually a diagram um i, I forget who maintains that that diagram this is like a, the data landscape has the mad data landscape yeah, yeah. so if you look at, at the um uh, the the picture from uh, 2012 it fits legibly in a in a slide on the on the screen. If you look at the one today, you have to zoom in like three levels before you can see anything. It's like so many uh, alternatives and options. So so it it is a very complicated complicated space these days. Um, I, I I think you have to look at what what problem are you trying to solve. Like you don't want to jump into Technology for technology's sake, and actually, I'll be wary of anyone that sells, says you should switch just because it, the technology is cool. Like uh, chasing the the latest fad is, is uh, it's not it's not not usually a, a recipe for success. So you have to understand what your what your use case is, and and then um, yeah, and then yeah, you, you have you have to pick the the technologies that. Will satisfy the use case. The, the use case, not the technologies that, that are cool at the, at the point in time, um, and it really depends on on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to do like real time workloads, there's a, a whole set of technology that will support that. If you if you all all, all you care about is large scale data analytics, um, I mean, there's a set of um, uh, technology like uh, Trino, um, Iceberg, etc. that can they can support the use case uh, more effectively. So. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much.